Okay, folks, let's uh, go ahead and get started here with uh, today's seminar. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming today. My name is uh, Cody Thompson. I'm the Mammal Collection Manager and Assistant Research Scientist at the, in the Museum of Zoology. It is my pleasure to introduce today's seminar speaker, Jessica Light. Jessica is an Associate Professor and Curator of Mammals at Texas A&M University. Jessica completed her bachelor's and master's degree at the University of Michigan, so Ann Arbor is, is, a lot, a lot, is like a second home to her. Um, after her time at Michigan, Jessica went on to Louisiana State for her doctoral studies before moving on to the University of Florida for her postgraduate work. Jessica's research program is broadly focused on the evolution, systematics, and population genetics of mammals and their parasites. Her research for program relies heavily on field work and natural history collections, and she's published nearly 70 peer-reviewed articles in high-impact journals such as Bioscience, Emerging Infectious Diseases, Journal Biogeography, Journal Mammalogy, Journal of Wildlife Diseases, Molecular Ecology, Molecular Phylogenetics, and Evolution in PLOS One. Much of this research has been funded by the National Science Foundation and, and other extramural sources. Uh, Jessica is also an active leader in the scientific community. She currently serves on the board of the American Society of Mammalogists and the Society of Systematic Biologists. In addition, she is an ombuds person for the American Society of Mammalogists and has been instrumental in adding the Mammal I Like Group uh, program excuse me, to the ASM annual meeting. I've been fortunate to work with Jessica in these efforts and have seen her commitment to expanding to the society's support systems firsthand. Uh, she's an incredible advocate and I'm happy to call her a friend and colleague. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Jessica Light, and I look forward to hearing her talk titled of Mice and Museums, Using Natural History Collections to Understand the Diversity and Distribution of North American Deer Mice. Jessica. Is this working? Yeah, yeah okay. Thank you, Cody. Um, and thank you, everyone, for having me. I'm really excited to be back at my alma mater to get to present some of my research. Um, since my time here, actually, as an undergraduate. And I thought I'd elaborate first a little bit more about my beginnings as a researcher and a biologist. And it started right here in Ann Arbor. I'm originally from Michiganders, or Michigan, so I'm a Michigander. And as Cody mentioned, I got my undergraduate degrees from here. But I started out, like many undergraduates pre-med, um, overly optimistic in my abilities to pass introductory biology. And I was able to have the fortune of going to the biological station in a moment of crisis after my sophomore year of, I'm, I can't get A's in this class, I can't be a medical doctor, what am I gonna do? And it was through my first summer at the University of Michigan Biological Station that it was um, starting to settle in my mind the different types of careers I could have and how much I really liked biology. And um, from that point, I got involved in undergraduate research, which also helped me to determine <coughs> research. I really like this in the biological fields. This is what I want to do. So I went on to my um, PhD at Louisiana State um, University, where I worked in the Museum of Natural Science and did a lot of museum work as a graduate student. And then I was affiliated with the Florida Museum of Natural History at the University of Florida before starting my job at Texas A&M University where I'm a curator of mammals. So starting in my um, graduate education is when I started getting more affiliated with collections and natural history museums and that's gonna be a recurring theme throughout my talk today. I'm a mammologist, which is um, a lucky field to be in because I get to examine a lot of extreme morphological diversity within one particular group of animals. So you can see on this slide the different types of morphologies that we can see across mammalia, including things that are obligate aquatic to things that fly, and a variety of body sizes from just a few grams all the way up to tons in, in terms of, of whales. I'm also very interested in a strange sort of way in parasites. This is also an extremely diverse group, both taxonomically. On this slide, you can see things that are intracellular parasites, all the way up to organisms that are um, macro in terms of their size as ectoparasites on or sometimes within the bodies of their organisms. And this doesn't even include parasitic vertebrates. 
and, and other species. So with parasites, I get another type of diverse group that I can work with, again, taxonomically, but also numerically, where it has been estimated that for every single organism on Earth that they're parasitized by at least two other organisms. And my hope is, in some of the research that I do, is that I can study the associations between mammals and their parasites, and perhaps glean some takeaways about evolutionary and ecological processes, because oftentimes parasites and their hosts are distantly related. And that's what's shown on these images of the slide. These are various examples of symbioses of different animals working and living together that are often, often um, distantly related. So if we have the possibility of long-term associations between these really different things, maybe in understanding those interactions, we can learn more about ecology or evolution um, as a whole. Some of my favorite parasites are lice. Um, these are the things of nightmares for those of us with children, um, because it also includes our very common head louse, um, which is very difficult sometimes to get out of your household if it's there. Um, these pictures are not to scale. In general, lice are just a few millimeters in length not very wide, maybe one millimeter total in width. And they are parasites exclusively of birds and mammals. Uh, for a lot of my research, as we'll get to in a little bit, I worked with rodents. And the lice are extremely small on them. And at least when I started my career, there was a necessity to get out into the field, to collect the rodents and then collect my favorite parasites, the lice, from those rodents. So these are pictures of me in the field from graduate school, all on up to just a few years ago. Um, it's just work that I've been doing um, as part of my research program. Once I'm in the field and I collect the rodents that I'm interested in, I need to get the parasites from them. So that involves humane university and state approved procedures for euthanization. And if I'm going to euthanize these animals for science just to get their parasites, you better believe I'm going to make sure they're available for more than just my research. So I deposit these specimens into natural history collections. Um, the picture on the bottom left are some skins of pocket gophers. The pictures on the right are some paramiscus specimens from collections. And my hope is that through my research, I can helpfully benefit the research of others by installing these specimens into collections. From the specimens, especially on the mammal side of things, I'll look at a variety of characters because I'm primarily interested in evolution and evolutionary interactions both within groups as well as between groups. So if I'm talking or thinking about within groups, say just the mammals, I'll look at things like their external morphology, even the pelage characteristics of the pocket gophers in the top left. Some of them have white on their rumps. That was actually a diagnostic character in um, the case of our study. We've looked at cranial morphology to see if there's any differences in size um, among different lineages of groups that we've looked at. We've looked at chromosomes as well as distributional data to try to get a better sense of are we working with you know, one species or multiple species and what kind of characters out there could support um, differences that we may be seeing. Of course, there's also molecular data which is a nice way to look at things um, if you're not an expert in morphology of particular groups. The images on this slide are kind of outdated. Um, this is Sanger sequencing, which um, isn't used so much anymore, uh, although I still use it, but we have a lot of researchers shifting over to high throughput sequencing and genomic techniques. But those can be extremely helpful at trying to understand aspects of evolution about the organisms that you work with. Some of the favorite mammals that I work with, I wanted to spend a little bit of time on here because you don't get them in Michigan. They're pocket gophers and heteromyid rodents. Um, these organisms are sister taxa, so they're closely related to each other. And one of the uniting characters that you can see are the middle images on this slide. Pocket gophers and kangaroo rats have fur-lined cheek pouches where they can store food as they move them about their burrow systems or caches. And, um, the top picture with the cheek pouches is a pocket gopher where you can actually see some vegetation that's being stored in those pouches. This is a, a map showing the distribution of different genera of pocket gophers. So we're talking Western Hemisphere only. There's, um, I don't know, five or so genera currently recognized. And these are really interesting organisms because they're fossorial. 
This means that they live pretty much solely underground. They're highly adapted for an underground lifestyle of digging. They're digging burrow systems underneath the ground. So they have um, these morphological traits where I describe them as like mini meatloafs or mini cigars or rather large cigars. They're kind of tubular in shape, perfect for these burrow systems. They have um, enlarged claws and teeth, which you can kind of see with the top picture of the pocket gopher there for digging. And this means they're, again, highly adapted for being underground. So they don't get out much. They have low vigility. They don't disperse very high distances above ground. And these can lead to really long-term associations with any interacting organisms like parasites. Now, heteromide rodents, the sister taxa to pocket gophers, have a similar distribution also in the Western Hemisphere. There are five genera currently recognized, the, the slide says six, and about 60 or so species, but it's a morphologically diverse group. We have things that look like little mini kangaroos. They're called kangaroo rats and kangaroo mice. But then we also have scansorial things that run around quadrupedally for legs on the ground. So they're, they're very different in terms of their morphology compared to their sister group. Um, they're also ecologically important as um, seed dispersers, uh, especially in desert and neotropical habitats. Um, these organisms also burrow to a limited its extent, and they too often have long-term associations with associated organisms like parasites. So in my career to date in looking at host parasite associations, I've looked at both the pocket gophers and the kangaroo rats and their respective lice. So kangaroo rats have lice like our head lice. They're closely related. But pocket gophers in the top left have a different type of louse called a chewing louse um, that we also found or find in some other groups of mammals as well as birds. Um, since I've been at Texas A&M, it's a story I'll tell in a little bit, I've also looked at tick mammal associations, especially in light of tick-borne um, diseases, and I'll get back to that in a second. I generally start out systematically with my groups. I want to try to figure out what's going on with each of the, the groups that I'm interested in studying, especially if they have a wide distribution. So this project is on the hispid um, pocket mouse. It's a heteromyid rodent with a really big distribution, the Midwest all the way down through central Mexico. And with the assistance and collaboration of the undergraduate researcher, John Anderson, who's up at the top right, we did a phylogeographic study to at least get us started. What's going on with this mammal host group? And if you look at the phylogeny over to the right, there's a lot of like really short branches. So it doesn't seem like there's a lot, but there is this one clade in central Mexico that's kind of popping out. And there might be something different going on there with that lineage as well as its parasites. Along with systematics and phylogeography, I also dabble in a little bit of population genetics. Um, this is a different kangaroo, um, sorry, a different heteromyoid group, kangaroo mice of microdipodops in the Great Basin Desert. And there's definitely some interesting things going on here in terms of currently unrecognized species and population demographics over time with populations expanding as well as contracting. So I'll, I'll work on this from the host's perspective and try to get an idea of what am I working with before I look at the associations with the parasites. And I'll do similar techniques with the parasites. I try to understand what's going on in terms of diversity. What am I working with? This slide is an example of a phylogeny of lice that are found in birds throughout South Africa. Um, and this was a big collaborative effort with people that are way better at identifying bird lice than I am, as well as bird people, which I am not. Um, but it's been really interesting to discover new host parasite associations by looking at, at new novel lineages of birds that haven't been previously examined. And then I'll take what I've learned for both the host as well as the parasites, and I'll compare the phylogenies. This is a pattern-based way to try to get at what are the associations like between these distantly related organisms. So the picture on the top, as well as the bottom, I have a host phylogeny on the left, and then a parasite phylogeny on the right, and lines that are connecting you know, names in the different colors indicate a host parasite association. And on the phylogeny at the nodes where you see either the closed circles or the open circles, that indicates places where if you compare that host and parasite tree, there's perfect congruence. 
And you can perform some statistical tests to determine is this more congruence than what you would expect by chance alone. And this is a great first start to try to get at what kinds of long-term associations or short-term associations could be going on between interacting taxa like hosts and parasites. And this is a lot of how I started my career, trying to understand these associations from more of a macro perspective, a pattern perspective. I've also had the opportunity to expand out, though, in some more ecological research. So soon after I started at Texas a and I had a colleague from Michigan. Um, Michigan State actually moved down there, and we started a little research program where we wanted to make some observations of how about tick-borne pathogens in Texas? Do we have a lot? No one's really looked at it to the extent like they have, say, in the Northeast when you're looking at vectors of Lyme disease or vectors of other diseases. Um, so with the collaborators depicted on the bottom left, we did field surveys of mark recapture. We looked for ticks. We then analyzed. Um, data from those ticks, as well as from ear biopsies of the rodents to see if we have tick-borne pathogens. And we're still working on publishing this because the short answer is like we don't have a lot of anything down there. So when these pathogens are in low prevalence, it becomes very difficult to detect molecularly. So we want to feel like really confident before we publish these results. But in general, it does look like we don't have a lot going on, at least in our particular part of Texas where we did this study possibly as a result of um, herpafauna, herpetofauna, like lizards, breaking up that pathogen cycle. It's also possible we could have some ecological predators involved in the system. So this is something else you should all be happy you don't have here in Michigan. These are red imported fire ants, and I think I hate them more than mosquitoes. They are truly <laughs> the worst um, with their stings and responses to the stings, and they are voracious predators of invertebrates, including ticks, as well as small organisms like mammals and nesting birds. So it's possible maybe, and we've done a little bit of research on this, that maybe red imported fire ant predation of ticks could also be breaking up the tick-borne pathogen cycle, at least in our part of Texas. And these are observations that we're hoping to continue with in future years and perform some more experimental studies in the field to see if we can get at that a little more. And um, you couldn't really tell from the previous slide in this one that this work, even though we didn't find much in terms of tick-borne pathogens, was a lot of time in the field, which gives you a lot of time to make observations, some of them novel and new to science. So while we were doing this project, we would find these mice in the field that had these like pustules on their tails. So you can really clear, see that clearly in the top picture. And the bottom picture, it's a much smaller pustule, but that rodent also has a few pustules on its um, feet as well. And in collaboration with some people who were doing histopathology, some veterinary scientists, and even the CDC, we determined that in building a phylogenetic tree, we had a novel lineage of pox virus, and that is shown in red on the right within the other um, taxa of viruses on that phylogeny. So at this point, we don't know the full distribution of this pox virus. We know it's um, found in a couple of different rodent species, um, but we're hoping to keep our eyes out and peeled while we're in the field to see more cases of this so that we can more thoroughly understand it and maybe determine if we have an issue that we need to worry about. So these observations that you can make in the field or maybe be like closely reading the literature, I think are really important. And they can allow you to take your research in novel trajectories. And this is where I'm gonna switch gears to this guy. Um, this is a picture taken by Phil Myers. He's an emeritus professor here in the department. This is Paramiscus maniculatus, the North American deer mouse. Uh, it's a rodent in the family Chrysetidae, and there's currently over 50 subspecies recognized. That's a lot of subspecies, right? And you might wonder how such um, a mouse, which we figure are all pretty small in size, right, could have so many subspecies. And a lot of that has to do with its distribution. These are records from GBIF. Um, the sizes of the dots indicate more records from a particular area, but these are observations and preserved specimens of Paramiscus maniculatus 
totaling um, over 214,000 from all across North America. So with such a big distribution, it makes sense that over time, new subspecies are described, maybe based on something morphologically, maybe based on something in terms of their distribution. But this is a pretty big geographic area for a small rodent to occupy. Um, this is an image made by my colleague Sharon Jansa in yellow in the background over North America is the um, perceived distribution of this species. And species in each of those green dots are um, records, locality records that are in museums. So again, big old distribution, right? And this could lead anyone to ask that question of are there cryptic species? Just by observing the distribution of this species alone as well as field observations about what they look like in different areas. And I am certainly not the first person to ask this, um, not the first person to ask this question even in this room. Um, there have been studies that have come out that have found or believe that they've found unique lineages within Paramiscus uh, maniculatus across its distribution. So each of these polygons and different shadings and shapes are from different studies showing where they think they're finding some unique lineages. In 2019, two papers independently tried to just summarize all of these past papers where each of the colors on this map um, in the center of the slide indicates a possible unique species, some which were part of Maniculatus previously, some which were not. But there's one issue with these previous studies, at least that this map is based on and that those previous studies were based on, is that they looked at one molecular data point only. And those were genes from the mitochondrial genome. The mitochondrial genome is a great place to start when you want to try to get a sense of if there's anything going on within the lineage, maybe some diversification. But at least in my research and oftentimes throughout different organismal communities, basing species descriptions on one data type is a little bit questionable. We want more data. We want to feel really confident of do we have something different going on. Now you might want to ask yourself, okay, it's a mouse, but who really cares if there's cryptic species, right? And I don't care. I don't interact with this mouse anyway. Well, except that you probably do. Um, so paramiscus mice in general are model organisms in a variety of different scientific fields. I did a web of science search about two weeks ago, more than 2,000 publications on paramiscus. That's a lot. Um, in terms of model systems and different types of research, evolutionary biology, um, these organisms are often used. Adaptation, there's some really amazing studies of adaptations to high elevation, to aridity um, in terms of desert habitats. And um, these organisms are often easy to work with in the lab so they can serve as model organisms in genetic and genomic types of studies. Maybe this still feels a little far removed for you. So let's take it to disease ecology. Paramiscus are known reservoirs for a variety of diseases and tick-borne pathogens, including Lyme disease, which I mentioned earlier, as well as hantavirus. And look at this puppy that came out last year. Um, this is based on a lab colony, but SARS-CoV-2 has been found to be able to be um, transmitted among paramiscus maniculatus mice. So we do have, or we should have, interest of what are we dealing with taxonomically in this group that serves as a model system for a variety of biological studies and can also teach us so much about adaptation, evolution, and disease ecology. We need to know what species we're working with to make sure that as we try to better understand these systems, we can clearly uh, describe those systems to the general public and the scientific community by knowing what our, ho our host organism actually is. So recently in 2019, I was lucky enough to be awarded funding from the National Science Foundation for a mid-career opus, which is like a, allowed me to take my research in a novel research direction, which is paramiscus for me. And my hope is, is to use molecular and morphological data, my hope, my plan, is to use these data to test hypotheses of cryptic species, to see what we have across this huge distribution, which seems a little scary, right? We're talking about this big distribution. How is this going to be even a feasible project? That's where natural history collections come into play. 
Remember this map from earlier? Every one of those green dots is a specimen from a natural history collection. So in collaboration with Sharon Jansa at the bottom left and my graduate student, Natalie Hamilton, to the right, we are trying to start this investigation by working with specimens from collections to try to assess if we have cryptic species. Um, so as I said, we started this and I got funded in 2019, right? And then COVID hit. So I'm gonna tell you what our plans are, um, but I have no data, so invite me back in a few years and then I'll have some more data. But our plan molecularly is we're gonna look at ultra-conserved elements, or UCEs. These are highly conserved regions of the genome. On the right is a um, protocol of how to isolate these fragments. Um, but there's greater than 2,000 orthologous loci across the genome that we can work with. Now this name is a little concerning maybe, ultra-conserved elements, and I'm talking about trying to pick out cryptic species within one larger group. So this could be concerning of like, how am I gonna get enough signal to address my questions? And that's because you can look at the, um, uh, the edges of these ultra-conserved elements and you can see a lot of variability. So the ultra-conserved elements, um, and most of these figures are shown in the red and the orange colors, but then you can get the variable regions in the yellow. And that's what we're gonna focus on to try to see if we have any type of indication of something going on in terms of molecular differentiation among the groups that we work with. So UCEs do indeed have a broad utility. There's over 750 studies to date publishing them over a variety of evolutionary time, both um, um, more shallow, more recent splits, as well as older splits. So this is a map on the left of what our sampling is, our requests of specimens from natural history collections, and we think we've done an okay job with the taxa that we've selected to, to do this preliminary study. That's what it is, it's a starter using these types of molecular data to see what's gonna happen. Along with getting those orthologous loci, we're also gonna get the full mitochondrial genome, so we'll be able to analyze that. And we'll use high throughput sequencing techniques, phylogenetic analysis, and analyses for species delimitation to try to figure out what's going on with this group. Do we have any cryptic species? Now there's one hiccup with this whole plan, but I'm gonna come back to that later, hopefully keep you on your, you know, the edge of your seat. Um, but I'm gonna transition now to the morphological data that we're hoping to collect. Historically, mammologists would take um, linear measurements, specifically from the cranium, which is depicted on the left, different abbreviations for different bones or lengths of the skull that we would examine. More recently, folks have been imaging the skulls from a variety of perspective, whether that's the ventral view or lateral view, and landmarking, putting points at um, parts of the bone, like usually sutures between bones that would be homologous among different individuals and taxa, and then analyzing those um, geometrically to try to pull out differences in size or shape. We're gonna go a little different route. We're gonna explore the many, many, many fluid preserved specimens in natural history similar, or natural history collections similar to this jar of mold that I got from the internet. We could use a relatively new technique, computed tomography, and um, get at a bunch of elements of our organisms, both cranial as well as postcranial elements, to explore morphology in a new way. This is a total plug for a project that Cody is a co PI on, overt or open vertebrate. This is an initiative to CT scan greater than 20,000 fluid preserved specimens, representing a pretty high diversity of vertebrate organisms. And this picture slide, which is a credit to another one of the overt PIs, is showing from one frog in a jar the different types of data you can collect from it with CT scanning. Um, to the right of the frog, you can get at a bunch of the hard measurements, skull characteristics, um, skeletal. You can do a whole bunch of things like make 3D models of different parts of the bodies to use in education. To the right, you could stain internal organs and other aspects of internal anatomy to get at a whole bunch of other different types of, of morphology of these organisms. So thanks to Cody and others from over, and I'm gonna show you what the CT scanning process is like by using this lizard here. So I'm gonna move forward a little bit. We have a rotating X-ray on the left. 
and that is um, the CT scanner is going around this organism, and the red line coming down translates to the Z stack, or these little slices, through the organism. And this is what the CT scanner is doing. Um, you can see the vertebrae on the right, and the Z stack image, and all the ribs popping off of that through these slices. So we're going down the length of the lizard. It's kind of mesmerizing just to watch it go. Now we're just looking at the final tail vertebrae until we get to the very bottom of the scan. This is another view of going through the process of the CT scanning of different organisms and then pulling out or segmenting out skeletal elements for future analysis. Um, again, this is credit to the OVERT team. Cody provided some of these for me as well as some other um, fish researchers. So we're looking at a Z stack in different views from X, Y, and Z axes. And we're gonna segment out that lizard skeleton in a second. And then look at different regions of the body that we're interested in, whether that's the cranium or someplace else. But using these full fluid preserved specimens, can open up the door for the different types of morphological characters we can look at. It's kind of a fishing expedition. We don't know what's gonna happen, but it'll still be interesting to see. So in my case, working with mice, we can segment out from our CT scanner a full paramiscus manipulated skeleton. We'll segment out in different colors the regions that we're interested in. I've done a little bit of this work. I am by no means an expert. It's loads of fun, but it takes hours. Hour. So I'm going to zoom in just to the left forelimb of the specimen, specifically the hand. It's a little messy. It's a little globby, but it's how I'm isolating those bones. And maybe this doesn't look so bad until you look at this specimen from a different view and you realize he's like a Mr. Smithers mouse with the fingers kind of interlacing. So it became very difficult to um, segment out the specific left limb that I was interested in with these um, these digits overlapping each other. Mr. Smithers from The Simpsons, got it? Yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> so it's an enjoyable but very um, long process. So on the right here we have the map of fluid preserved specimens that we've requested. We're gonna look at a bunch of cranial and postcranial elements for um, morphometric analysis with landmarking initially, but we're also gonna do some measures as well of various bones and try to get at the length of those bones as well. And we're hoping via analysis of a variety of elements, maybe there'll be something, something morphological that can help us differentiate different taxa within this widely distributed species. So I mentioned one hiccup. And here's our, again, our molecular sampling and morphological sampling. Again, I think it's pretty good, but we got an issue. And that is that manipulatus, paramiscus manipulatus does not exist in a vacuum. It is co-distributed with other paramiscus species. So what you can see on this map, there's like a tannish color that has the largest distribution. That is maniculatus. And all the other different colors of gray or green or yellow and red that are overlying that are different paramiscus species. And unfortunately, they look a lot alike. And there's more than 60 paramiscus species recognized to date, likely some very rapid ecological associations. So this basically puts us in the position of we need to know that we're working with the right species before we start analyzing it, whether molecularly or morphologically. So we're having um, to stumble across a problem that has been well recognized in the mammal community for years. These are screenshots of peer-reviewed publications trying to differentiate paramiscus species in different geographic areas. And this isn't even the half of those studies, right? There's more. And these were only the ones that I took screenshots of. So this is not a novel problem. Um, and it's also one where I can't use any one of those studies to be like, oh, I just need to look at this. And that's gonna tell me if I have maniculatus or leucopus or atwateri or something else. There's differences in how to tell apart species depending on where you're located geographically. So we basically need to go in and effectively barcode because we do have pretty good genetic measures to differentiate species. So this is an old school agarose gel 
after a PCR. Um, we could, of course, cycle sequence and send things off for sequencing and um, determine what species we have that way, but this is a lot of money and a lot of steps. So this is a PCR test that we can do with um, museum specimens where we have some positive controls of things that I know are Paramiscus, say, Maniculatus versus Leucopus. Ooh, the mouse works, okay. So this is a positive control of Maniculatus. I'm on the center screen right now. And a positive control of Leucopus. And I can work with museum specimens and amplify a very short fragment and see where it lines up. So in this case where my mouse is, this is telling me, okay, good, I got all Maniculatus, that's what I wanted. But if we go on the other side of my DNA ladder here, oops, that's a Leucopus. There's another one right there. So I have to do this test first to make sure, again, that I'm working with the right species because to include the wrong species will definitely lead to incorrect interpretations of my data. So this is my hiccup, and this is what has slowed us down as we're trying to move forward along with COVID um, to try to address what are we dealing with in terms of this very widely distributed species. And again, hopefully we can check back in a few years and we'll have some really awesome informative data, whether it's UCE or CT scan morphological data. So since I don't have specific results to tell you, I thought I would transition to a study that I did closer to my home in Texas, where I specifically wanted to work on morphologically differentiating two paramiscus species, Leucopus and Maniculatus. So what these maps are, are county distributions of each of our species. And because the entire state of Texas is highlighted in this like lightish brown color, that means we believe the species, each species, to exist across the entire state. But if you look at the black dots in each of the counties, that's where we have positive evidence of those species occurring, museums and records, or at least what we think are those species um, in museums. And this was a big collaborative team of researchers to do just this one little project in Texas. Um, we have some undergraduate students here, our graduate students, um, as well as some other folks that are well-versed in morphological techniques and paramiscus systematics. And first, we looked at museum records. So I have two maps on the left, Leucopus and the Maniculatus, and the darker green a county is tells you that we have primarily 100% or primarily of that species in that county. So if you see a really dark green box for Leucopus, that means all the records and collections are from Leucopus for that county. Similarly, if you look over to Maniculatus, if you see dark green counties there, it means 100% of the records we have are Maniculatus from that county. And you could see a difference in just eyeballing the greens between these two maps. We don't seem to have a lot of Maniculatus in the eastern part of the state. So how come? Is that because they're not really there? Or are they there and just folks haven't collected them? So we wanted to focus our study on the eastern part of the state in part because we're worried about, worried about this broader cryptic species issue. So we're pretty sure everything in the eastern part of the state is one Maniculatus species. So blue and red dots give us an indication of our sampling for both Leucopus and Maniculatus. We solely did or wanted to do a morphological assessment, but of course I needed to genetically identify everything first so that I didn't have the problem of analyzing the wrong species. Turns out over a third of our data set was misidentified. So that was pretty big, so I'm really glad we did that step. But at least we knew what we were dealing with. And we wanted to look at a comparison of the traditional old school linear measure techniques of using calipers to measure different lengths and widths on the skull compared to the newer geometric morphometric techniques and hoping that we could maybe advise the paramiscus community, hey, use this technique, it's great. Well, as it turns out with our analyses, our traditional digital linear measures, or rather just linear measures, were better at differentiating Leucopus and Maniculatus. And you can see that on the top two figures. Um, these are PCA plots that we analyzed without putting in a priori distinctions of what our species were, and we kind of applied what we knew what each specimen was after the fact. And you can see that blue in Leucopus does not overlap red in Maniculatus. Not much at all. But our geometric morphometrics and looking at shape, we have red and blue overlapping there. So that technique in trying to use shape to differentiate the two species 
did not work for us. But if we took centroid size of our organisms and got at size, that did help us differentiate the two species. So in this particular system in East Texas, comparing only Leucopus to Maniculatus, we can use traditional morphometrics or centroid size um, from geometric morphometrics to differentiate the two species. And we also think by looking at a broader um, diversity of specimens and looking at external characteristics, that it does indeed look like that Maniculatus is mostly gonna be found west of this um, Balcones escarpment. It's um, a topological region within the state that kind of separates the eastern moisture forested area part of the state to drier desert habitats. So we find mostly Leucopus pretty much all across the state, but Maniculatus seems to be mostly west. And we're hoping to slowly expand um, our, our sampling here to get at this question in more detail. And something I didn't mention earlier is we did use primarily, if not solely, museum specimens to do this research and hopes that it will help then help give us insight to address the bigger question of the entire species across its full distribution. And um, one thing I'm hoping to do while entering this paramiscus world is to get back to some of my original interests in host parasite associations. Parasites, or paramiscus, they live with parasites as well. So this is my warning. I'm gonna show you a really gross video of bot flies, which my UMBS students that are here, hi everybody, got to see this firsthand this summer. So if you might get grossed out, just close your eyes, it lasts about 20 seconds. But this is a bot fly um, emerging from its host. It's actually different. Oh my god, are you gonna catch it in your hand? So huge. Ew. Catch it. Oh my god. Ew. I don't know how to turn the volume Ew. down. This is so nice. <laughs> 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 what is it? Is it a so there it is. Um, so there's parasites of paramiscus. So I can totally go into botfly research if I wanted to. And we certainly learned a lot about them this summer, and I'm hoping to learn more and, and maybe take my research down that avenue as well in the future. I want to wrap up by tying back together the importance of natural history collections, because they've effectively facilitated my entire research program. Um, and recognizing their utility across a variety of fields is not new. It's something that museum curators have been pushing for years and years, and it shows up in popular press, it shows up in peer-reviewed articles, where museum specimens can be used for a whole variety of different research topics. So many. Um, they could be used for education, Museum specimens are really great in trying to recognize um, how species are responding to climate change. Just their utility is just insane. But our natural history collections are often at great risk of sustainability, of whether or not they're gonna be around uh, for a while. Um, we've seen recent issues of fires in Brazil destroying entire natural history collections. We've seen other instances at university collections where the collections are no longer valued. What's more impart, important is that track and field team and having the property available to build that track. So despite maybe researchers and curators recognizing the importance of these collections, they're often at risk because they're not valued by other people inside as well as outside the scientific community. So this is a little plug. If if I've at all convinced you or you know from your own experience why yes, collections are important and you might be asking yourself, what can I do to make them better? These are just a few ideas. Maybe you can collect specimens in your research and deposit them in collections. Correct, collections growth is a great way to show collections utility. Maybe you can just use specimens in your research. I am doing that a lot right now and I'm gonna acknowledge every single one of those collections and every single specimen in my research. And I'll be making sure to supply the PDFs of those publications to the curators so that they could maybe show their administration how specimens have been used, uh, specifically specimens in their collections. You can get involved in collections. You guys have an awesome natural history collection here. So it's a great way to maybe teach others, use specimens and education initiatives for those of you that do want to go into education. There's lots of great ways to use specimens for that. Um, get people involved in collections early. High school students. 
undergraduate students, there's tons of work that we could do in collections where anyone interested will certainly have an impact. And you can also get into science communication in a variety of ways where you can constantly plug things like the importance of collections. So what I've done so far, at least in my effort, to try to show the utility of specimens along with using specimens and installing them to collections is I try to publish about their importance. Um, I've had a couple publications in the last few years about that. I try to work at making sure that specimen data become uh, available to the scientific and broader community. So this slide is summarizing not so much a mammal initiative, but a parasite initiative. Parasite collections are leagues behind vertebrate collections in terms of digitizing and making available specimen records. So I'm trying to get and use funding to make that specimen data available. And I also play around with a little bit of science communication. March is coming up pretty soon. Who cares about basketball when you can do March Mammal Madness? So I highly recommend you know, Googling this if you haven't heard about it, but it's a great way to communicate science to a broad range of, of ages and education levels. And, and this is where I'm gonna stop. The slide I'd like to leave up are all the students that I've had the great fortune of working with since I've been um, at my job at Texas A&M. And I wanna thank you all for your attention and I'd be happy to take any questions if there's any time. I mean, I didn't present a lot of data, so I get it. <laughs> yes? Is there any potential for hybridization going on between all the Hybridization? Is that what you're asking? So the question is potential for hybridization among all the different paramiscus. Within maniculatus, almost certainly, but at this point we don't even know the edges of their distributions, assuming that we have different species. Um, across known species that are already recognized, we see more hybridization among, as you would expect, closely related species than really distantly related ones. Um, so there's another species in my neck of the wood called the woods called the cotton mouse, Pyramiscus gossypinus, and we know that one hybrid hybridizes with its sister taxa, Pyramiscus leucopus. And there's probably other cases that I'm just not familiar with, but I think hybridization in general is probably more common anyway than what we're aware of. Yes. So the question is, given the, the large distribution of maniculatus, what about it might have facilitated such a large distribution? Um, that's a good question, and it's one where we probably need to get a little bit better at the evolutionary history of the species, of when it originated and started to diverge, likely responding to climatic events. Um, but the other thing is, right now, I'm assuming that if there's multiple cryptic species in here, that they're all closely related. And that may not be the case either. So we might actually be dealing with paramiscus species that are quite different from each other potentially. And um, the hope is, is that this project that we're working on will at least be a start. Um, our sampling's not dense enough, but it's better than what's been done in the past. So hopefully we can start to get at that answer once we're categorized what we're actually dealing with. Yeah, so that's what we think we have. So the question was about our Texas-specific issue where we have Leucopus and Maniculatus. We do think Leucopus, this is white-footed mouse, I didn't give its common name earlier, but we do think that one is found all across the entire state. But only Maniculatus, it was believed to occur across the entire state, but we think it's gonna be primarily west. And we're gonna need some, do some denser sampling there. I think our sample size was about 70 individuals. So we definitely need to broaden that out and have better geographic sampling to try to get a better sense of what the species limits might be within the state. Yeah, Don. Is there a possibility that uh, the species are cryptic to the parasites that you're interested in? And how would that create a problem? Okay, so the question was, is there a possibility that not only are these um, mice cryptic for us, but are they cryptic for the parasites? Um, 
Well, you can come at that question a lot of different ways because if you have a generalist parasite, they don't care anyway. So if they are happy with any mouse, it probably won't affect who they parasitize. However, it's possible the very opposite could occur, where we may have thought we had a widespread parasite, just like the mouse, but instead we have cryptic species of parasites that might be honing in to specific things about each one of those mouse lineages. Um, and oftentimes by, I would love to start it all morphologically and really bring things back to what it looks like, but usually it's the genetics that give us some sort of insight, oh, there's more going on here than what we thought. So it could go either way, and it will also probably be parasite specific. Maybe ticks don't care, but maybe lice do. Jenny. Yeah, we did. So we have a collaborator who used to be uh, involved down in Texas at TSM, our Texas Society of Mammalogists Association, is now at the CDC. And he's been trying to build colonies and pro uh, uh, facilitate growth of the pox virus in the lab so that we can study it in more detail. And he doesn't have a lot of time because there's other like more important viruses right now. So um, it's sort of on hold at the moment. But hopefully we can get some additional samples and go from there. So the question is that the distribution map that I showed, which is borrowed from a publication of Hopi Hoekstra's, only seemed to show one species in the southeastern U.S. Um, there's more than one there. It's a, there's a lot of overlapping distributions. So there's probably like four, I'd say four or five species in that general area. And for sure, the fire ants are likely affecting um, local populations in terms of densities of those populations. But a lot of rodents are pretty smart. Um, I feel like the vertebrates that are getting more affected by the fire ants are ground nesting birds. So sometimes those ants can swarm those nests. Um, so one of the locations where we worked at was for the endangered um, prairie chicken. And we were at a specific site that was trying to inhibit fire ants so that they can keep increasing the numbers of the prairie chicken. But those ants are pretty voracious. They were having to constantly treat with a type of exterminant to get rid of the ants. So I think mice are okay for the most part. They can groom pretty quickly, but those eggs and nestlings are goners. Ha, ha, ha.